so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, ski touring in Turkey tonight. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on me. So I came to ski touring, like I think a lot of Brits from, from climbing. Um, I started climbing as a teenager and uh, got really into rock climbing, did some kind of alpine stuff, uh, went out to Pakistan when I was 21 or so. And that was really my, my big passion. Um, but when I was in my mid twenties, uh, I did a, a sledge hauling expedition to the Arctic. So I managed to, with a friend of mine, I managed to raise enough cash to go and do a, one of those horrendous grueling Arctic sledge hauling things. And that was on skis. And from that trip, um, I, I'd hardly been skiing before. I'd done a, a couple of weeks of downhill skiing, but I had some skis, some telemark skis in that expedition. And I thought, okay, I've got the gear. I don't really know how to ski, but actually if I learn, uh, it opens up a whole new world of amazing stuff that I could do in the mountains in winter. So I spent the next few years going out to the Alps, uh, skiing, learning from a book how to telemark, coming back absolutely black and blue. Um, but actually over a few years, I gradually got to a point where I was kind of halfway competent, at least as a, as a telemarker, and I could start going out and doing some proper ski touring um, and also uh, moved away from kind of very long skinny skis to, to slightly wider skis and bigger boots and stuff. Um, and then I did my first kind of proper ski tour was the Hope Route in 2001. Um, and after that, I thought, okay, you know, we, I was, I and the, the friends that I was skiing with were at a level where we could we felt competent enough skiing that we could take it somewhere else and have a proper adventure with it. Um, so I started to think about where we could go and Turkey came up for, for a number of reasons. So we needed somewhere that was accessible for, we were kind of working full time. So we needed somewhere that was accessible for a week or two weeks trip um, that we could fly to, not particularly, you know, fairly cheaply. Um, the logistics was fairly straightforward when we were there. Um, and that there was going to be good terrain to ski in. Uh, and I'd visited Turkey quite a lot before. I'd done a lot of stuff there in the summer. I'd been trekking and mountain biking and just traveled around quite a lot. So I knew it quite well. And I knew some of the areas that we might think about going to. Um, so just to uh, take us to the map, thinking about where you might want to go in Turkey. So Looking at a map of Turkey, you can see straight away that it's got mountains all over the place. Um, and essentially, there's a, there's a large range of mountains on each of the big coasts. So on the Black Sea coast up here and on the Mediterranean coast down here, there's a, there's a pair of ranges that, that cover each side of the, of the kind of, it's almost like a subcontinent, but it's a huge peninsula. And in between, there's a high plateau and that gets gradually higher from west to east. And you can see that at the eastern end, a lot of it's above 2,000 meters, a lot of it's above 3,000 meters. Uh, and there's a high plateau between 1,500 and 2,000 meters, and then mountain ranges in a big kind of knot in that eastern end of the country. So looking at this map, you can see that there's lots of potential areas you can go. So the next thing to do is figure out where it snows a lot. Um, and this is just a map of uh, annual precipitation in Turkey. And you can see again that along the coasts and along those mountain ranges bordering the coasts is where most of the precipitation is. But also in the eastern side of the country in that high plateau area with the mountains, there's a lot there. And actually when you look at it, it turns out that most of that is in winter. So there's actually some really good snowpacks in winter all along the, the southern range, which is the Taurus mountains. And also particularly in this northeast corner, in an area called Kashgar, there's a lot of snow. Um, the next thing is that's really worth understanding about Turkey, and it's not immediately obvious. You kind of, I tend to think about it as a summer holiday destination. This is a, a map though of winter temperatures in, in Europe. And you can see from this that the Eastern Plateau in Turkey is more like Scandinavia in winter. So it's much colder than most of Europe, um, which came as a surprise to me. But when you realize that and you put that together with the precipitation 
you understand that there's going to be a lot of snow in those mountains. Um, and that confirmed what we thought at the time, having seen it in summer and seeing quite a lot of snow still in summer, thinking, OK, this, this would be a good place for an adventure. Um, so the first trip that I did there was in 2002, actually, just before we go there. This is um, just uh, a summary of what I think are the main areas in Turkey that have potential for ski touring. Um, and we'll actually go back to this at the end. Um, but the way that this map works, so the red areas are what I think of as the, the kind of premier ski touring destinations. Um, and we're going to be talking mostly about Kashgar, which is up here in the northeast, and then Aladar, which is down here in the center in the middle, and that's the highest range of the Taurus Mountains, uh, a little bit about Volcar, and then a couple of bits about um, some of the volcanoes. So the, the orange bits are kind of smaller ranges which have got potential for either short, short bits of touring or a few different places within that where you might do some short bits of touring. And then the purple ones, this, these are quite interesting. These are volcanoes. So there's, a, there's quite a few volcanoes in Turkey, but these four in particular are quite interesting from the point of view of ski touring. So the first ski tour that I did there, um, as I was saying, was in 2002. And this is in Kashgar, which is right up here in the northeast, near the border with Georgia. And it's a range of mountains uh, up to about just under 4,000 meters. Um, it's got some very small glaciers, um, but quite a lot of permanent snow. Um, and I'd been there in the summer, done quite a lot of trekking there, and thought it looked fantastic for ski touring. Um, it's, uh, they're good steep mountains, um, but not too, not, not terrain that looked kind of impossible. And at that stage, um, me and the people I was ski touring with were still primarily focused on doing on doing journeys. So, uh, and particularly kind of inspired by the Hope route, we were looking for something where we could take a few days worth of food and a pretty big rucksack and travel and do a, do a journey through the mountains. Um, so that's what we plan to do here. We had, we had two weeks and we wanted to essentially cover as much of the range as we could from starting from the southeast and, and southwest and heading northeast. And really the plan was just to stick as close to the watershed as we could. Um, at that time, there weren't really any maps. So the only map that we had was a little laminated photocopy of a piece of road atlas. And uh, it was about one to 600,000 and it had, so the whole two week trip was on about four inches of map and really didn't have anything on it useful at all. Um, but we, we understood where we wanted to get to. So there's a road pass over the mountains down here, which goes up to about 2,600 meters. We figured we could get transport to the snow line and then just head off and try and find a route through. Uh, so it was a real adventure. Um, it was kind of very speculative. We had a week's worth of food to start with and we, we planned to come down into one of the valleys on the north side and restock and then we would set off again and do uh, a second part. So uh, this is the route on Google Earth um, just for the first part of the journey and it's obviously quite low resolution but you can see essentially we've got these camps and we're trying to stick as close as we can to this main watershed along here. So we flew to a place called Trabzon, which is on the Black Sea coast of Turkey. Um, Turkey's really easy to fly to. There's good uh, internal flights. So you, they all go through Istanbul, but once you change there, you can fly to another 20 or so airports that are scattered all over the country. And it's reasonably cheap still. It's very well connected. Um, and this is just uh, trying to find a car to take us up to the mountains. I love this photo because it's a couple of shoeshine boys looking at our ski boots and thinking, can they possibly sell us a, a shoe shine on ski boots, which is brilliant. Um, so we managed to get a lift uh, part of the way in a taxi. And then this guy with a pickup truck was uh, kind enough to give us a lift to the end of the road where the snow started. Uh, and this is where we're jumping off. So this is, there were four of us on the trip, um, three, uh, three of us in the UK, all friends and 
a guy called Mike who we met on the Hope Route, an American guy, um, and we were all kind of uh, not fantastic skiers. We, we'd kind of learnt over the last few years and we were okay, but Mike was a brilliant skier. So we had this kind of slight division in the group between someone very talented and, the, and a bunch of Brits who are clumsy skiers. Um, so this is uh, heading up off the road up towards the top of the pass from where we were dropped. Um, and we reached the top of that, that road pass on the first day um, and camped at this spot here, um, just in a kind of broad open spot. The weather here is notoriously changeable. So you, from the precipitation map, you see it's very wet. Um, and one of the features of the trip was that the weather changed every day. So we had some snow, I think, on every day of the trip. Um, and it was very, it was very changeable. But actually, we we did get enough breaks in the weather to be able to always make some progress every day, um, which is great. So the following day dawned nice, um, and we are leaving the road here and heading up into these mountains up here. Um, and again, we we don't really have a map, so what we're doing is trying to work out where the main watershed is and following our noses and the terrain to try and work out where we're going to get through. Um, this is just heading up. You can see there's another range behind of quite nice looking peaks. Uh, and it's fairly gentle terrain at first. Uh, and then the weather started to come in as we're heading up. And again, this is the first afternoon really of proper touring. We're, we're trying to follow this watershed roughly, but we've no idea where we're going. And actually this is later on, during the afternoon, the cloud came in completely and it started snowing. Uh, we ended up on quite a steep slope here. It's a lot steeper than it looks. Um, and the afternoon was kind of getting on and we didn't have anywhere to camp. So we started going off and scouting out for campsites, which is why there's all these tracks going on all over the place. And actually we ended up in an amazing spot. Um, it was hollowed out in a, in a drift under a big overhanging cliff and in one of those big scoops that you get below a cliff. Um, and actually, as, the, as we got into the tent, the, the weather settled down and the clouds started dropping and we had this amazing sunset from this real kind of eagle's nest perch. Um, and this is the view in the morning. You can see all our tracks in the previous afternoon trying to find somewhere to put the tent. But amazing kind of panorama out over really endless snowy mountains. And this is a lot of Turkey is like this in the winter. There are huge expanses of snowy mountains. Um, so this is actually the campsite. You can see the overhanging rock here. And there was just enough room to dig out a spot for this four man tent. So it's a really, really special um, campsite, actually. Um, so we skied down it and it's up under here, under this rock up here. Um, really nice powder descent first thing in the morning. Um, and then we, we're heading around. So we're trying to stay on the north side of the watershed because that's where we think most of the, the better snow is going to be or more snow. Um, and we, this, the camp was essentially just below the watershed. So we're, we're contouring around now and we're going to cross this col and try and stay on the north side. Um, and this is the view we get from there. So we can see the next, next part of the journey. We've got to cross this col and that col there. And then this is a peak called Vercenic, which we're heading for. That's a, one of the highest peaks. And that's the kind of next watershed. And these moments turned out to be really, really important because as I say, the weather came in at some point every day. So we were in the mist and snow um, at some point on every day of the trip, but we got these, we got breaks. This was. A, Kind of nice morning but we got just enough breaks to to be able to see the route ahead um so we're traversing here again this is the watershed ridge we're just traversing below that um fairly nice gentle terrain at the moment um the weather starts to come in in the afternoon uh but we get over to the next place that we're going to camp um this is the next day, uh, pretty claggy. This is the peak of Vercenic. So we got to near the base of it that previous day, um, and, but the weather came in the next day. So we didn't really see it at all, unfortunately. It's a really spectacular peak. Um, and 
carried on through fairly poor weather. We're heading up for this coal here, I think. Um, and across that coal, down another long valley, and we saw a village for the first time. There's a lot of, in this area, there's lots of um, villages that are only populated in the summer. So a big part of the population is still uh, transhuman. So they do, uh, they come up to these summer villages with their livestock and graze up there. And then they desert the village completely in winter. And there's lots of them and some of them are quite big. So this one's got some two-story houses and shops and things like that. Um, and you'll see later on, there's, there's different, as you go further up, the villages get smaller and kind of more and more ramshackle, but there's, there's lots of them. Um, and then we had an interesting surprise on that afternoon. Um, just as we were leaving that little village, we came across these tracks. Um, and we'd seen some tracks previously in some kind of crusty snow and thought thought they were thought they were human and kind of was surprised because it was in the middle of nowhere and thought what would someone be doing here and this kind of told us what was really going on so this is obviously a big brown bear track um, we didn't we hadn't realized at all that they had bears here um, but actually apparently they have a lot of them um, so that was quite exciting and it's it's snowing at the time and you can see that these are pretty fresh and it's going the same way that we're going so we're heading up the same valley that this bear is going up so at this point we're fairly paranoid about meeting it um, so this is further up the valley where we decided to pitch camp you can see over here the bear tracks and our tracks we stopped at some point because we thought we really don't want to catch up with it um, and pitch camp and uh, we got into this habit of building a nice little wall around the tent um, just to protect it a bit from storms and also it's really a nice way to keep warm at the end of the day um, when you're uh, just before you kind of settle in for the night um, and you've stopped skiing. I find it's really good as a as a kind of exercise to keep you keep you moving and keep you warm without having to ski anymore. Um, very, it's often really worthwhile, I think. Um, so this is the following morning, um, really beautiful morning. Uh, and we're heading up this valley and up to Again, we're, we're following our noses, but we think we want to stay left of this range and find a col up here somewhere that will take us on to the next section. Um, and we're basically following the bear tracks. Um, this is just having packed up camp. But yeah, again, a beautiful morning. Uh, and heading up that valley, heading up towards whatever we find up here. Um, and again, getting closer up to Obviously, there's going to be a coal here. Um, still the bear tracks. And actually, we reached that coal and realized that it took us onto the wrong side of the range. So from that, we needed to cut back. And we actually reached another coal off to the side of that, which is higher up. And that's here. And this is looking back on some of the terrain that we've covered uh, in a valley down here and up this main valley here. And um, still beautiful weather, though. Um, and again, so here we are, we, uh, this is not actually the coal, there's another mini coal here. And then we're, we're trying to traverse across to, to get around a corner um, and up into the next valley. Quite a steep gully here, which we, um, which Mike skied very nicely, but um, all of us were quite apprehensive about. It's actually steeper than it looks. Um, so that was quite a challenge for us, but we, uh, we got down okay. Um, and that managed to that allowed us to cut quite a corner off, um, and then we ended up turning up another valley back towards the watershed. Again, really beautiful evening. Um, and we camped in a spot just up here. Oh, yeah, so just kind of in these flats over here. Another really nice looking peak here, um, and you can see the snowpack is really is really healthy up here. Um, We'll see a bit later um, some of the kind of how deep some of it was, but it's it's a really a really good a really good snowpack. It's as good as the best places in the Alps. And um, this is the day after Cross the Little and this kind of shows you the very graphically the difference in skiing style and uh, ability. So Mike had taken this photo and he's got some very nice tracks down here. This is the rest of us. Uh, trying to follow down, and uh, I think that's probably me lying in a crater there. Um, but yeah, 
trying to get down a fairly steep slope on our with our dodgy telemark technique and a big pack. Um, that was actually a quite exciting day. The weather really turned nasty, and uh, and most of the photos. Obviously, we didn't take many photos when the weather was bad. So this is the end of that day. Um, and again, it's cleared out enough for us to see where we are at least. Uh, and this is the morning in the same place. Um, you can see up here, there's a kind of, there's half of a building sticking out of the snow. And actually when we were down here, when we were setting the camp, we at one point skied over something, a kind of long thing in the snow and kind of had a look at it and realized it was actually, it was a corrugated iron roof. So it was the top of a building that we were skiing over the top of. It was the only sign that there was actually any habitation here at all. The rest of it is completely buried. So there's a really, really impressive snowpack. Um, so the next day, we are now on our seventh day, and this is our last day of food. So we need to ski out this day, um, but we're going to do one more call, and then that will get us close to the base of Kashgar, the highest peak, and then we're going to ski out from there. Um, so we cross this, heading up to this call, and actually this allows us to see the route from the day before. We had a very exciting descent in a complete whiteout down this face here. Um, and again, that was, we didn't know what was there at all. So we got onto this ridge. We knew we needed to be heading this direction, but we didn't know what was below. So it was a very tentative ski down this pretty steep slope into the mist, which is uh, quite exciting, but turned out okay. Um, uh, and then this again is the main watershed, so we're, we're staying parallel to that and crossing a coal close to that watershed. Uh, and then we're heading down on the other side. Uh, and this is a big valley that heads out northwards from below the highest peak. So this peak on the left here is Kashgar itself, which is just under 4,000 metres. Um, and uh, we're now heading out uh to to resupply basically um i love this photo this is three of us uh and we've got one pirate one kind of matinee idol then me looking like a complete idiot with a bit of uh sun cream on the end of my nose i really like that photo um so yeah skiing out again this is one of the valleys uh this is one of the villages kind of midway valleys and again you can see it's pretty well buried um and we skied all the way out this day. <coughs> um, so we're getting lower here into the forest zone. And there's some huge avalanches around this area uh, of old snow, not that we saw happening, but massive avalanche debris. And then quite a long walk out at the bottom uh, to get to the first place that was inhabited. Um, and actually, when we got there, we realized it was only about an hour from the coast, and there were no shops where we managed to find the first car. So we took a taxi out to the coast and we spent a whole rest day here and uh, this is on the Black Sea coast and this is the reason I'm showing this is a this is a fertilizer ship um, and we had our day off and we went to a went to a bar at lunchtime and met a guy who happened to be the captain of this ship and he showed us around his ship uh, which is a very random day off thing to do on a on a uh, on a ski tour but also great fun and it's one of those things that I love about ski touring in places like this is that you tend to end up having these very random but but kind of really fun experiences um yeah that's one of the pleasures of, of ski touring in kind of out of the way different places where people don't normally do it um so this is the second half of the journey um, and i'll race through these but uh this is just four days and we're again coming back from uh the place that we that we found our car and a day ski up to the first camp and then another three days and actually we end up crossing the range and out on the other side on the southern side um, again weather's very variable uh, but we did a long day up and made a camp at about 2400 meters um, this is just a big hole where we could get water from a stream that was still running um, and again beautiful evening light up in this high campsite uh, and then the next day was a kind of crucial day, uh, bad weather again. Um, and we ended up, we crossed the, crossed the coal, 
and got to a place where there was a kind of plateau and actually there was a frozen lake under there. And then it looked like there was very steep ground to get down to the main valley. Um, uh, so we took a bit of time trying to find the best route. Uh, and just by complete fluke came across this. There's one steep gully that cuts through this kind of cliff band. Um, so we followed that down and down to a campsite at the bottom. Um, uh, and then another beautiful morning, um, snowed in the night. And uh, this is a really, really spectacular spot. So it's below, there's some quite steep, rocky peaks, um, but it's nice mellow terrain below. Uh, and just really, really beautiful. Um, this is a, a kind of lake that's half covered in, in deep snow. So now we are heading off and looking for a pass that's going to get us over the main range. Um, and again, these are some of the, the rocky peaks on the watershed. And we need to get over that range somehow, somewhere. So at this point, we this is the camp we've just been in. We head down the valley and then start climbing over here. And we've got to find something through here. Um, and obviously, we don't know anything about what's up there. We don't have a map or photographs or anything. Um, this is a photograph. Uh, it's very poor quality, but I love it because it, to me, it really captures the spirit of ski touring in those kinds of places. And it's it's partly because it's so old that it's like this, but it's got that real kind of spirit of adventure. The weather's a bit ropey. Uh, we don't know where we're going. These peaks look quite steep and uh, intimidating, but we're going to find a way somewhere through there. Uh, so we we keep heading up, um, and it's a really spectacular terrain. Uh, we, this is looking back and the clouds coming in now behind us. Um, and just as it starts to come through, we, we make it up to a coal. It's really steep at the top, but we make it up to this little coal and that takes us through and actually we get down to the other side. Um, uh, and this, we had a big snowfall that night, the next night, and, and then a really nice ski out day after and out and down to Again, quite a walk out and a place where we could pick up a car. Um, and this was just a random person who had a car. We managed to persuade him to take us to um, the next decent town where we could where we could get a bus. Um, so yeah, that's that's the first and probably my kind of favourite ski tour in Turkey. And the reason the reason I love it was it was a real adventure. You know, we had a um, an idea of what we wanted to do, but very little, no real map and uh, just a kind of uh, a desire to try and find a route that would work and actually by a combination of real luck and enough breaks in the weather to to see enough every day to get a sense of where we were going it worked out amazingly um, and it kind of stands in my memory as one of the, the best adventures that I've had on skis because of that kind of unknown element about it. Um, okay so this briefly, I'll talk through a second trip that I did there. So, and this is uh, 2005, so three years later, um, I did a, I led an Eagle Ski Club trip there. Um, and we're essentially planning to do a very similar route, um, but I just wanted to do it as a club trip. I thought it was a great, um, a great adventure and a kind of like a turkey's answer to the Hope route. And I thought that would be a good thing for the, for the club to do. So got together a group of seven of us, um, and we headed up uh, on the same road, but there's a lot more snow this year, even more. Um, uh, but fantastic weather. Um, this is heading up from the head of the pass, uh, again, up into the higher terrain. Um, and it was very cold this year as well. Uh, just setting up the first camp. Um, and it was quite hard going. This is Steve uh, looking uh, suitably cold but also sweaty at the end of a pretty tough day. Um, this is Lizzie, uh, who was our kind of, uh, who's a phenomenon, anyone who knows her, the world's fittest woman and was fantastic to have on the trip. She did a lot of trail breaking. Um, uh, and also, so the weather on this trip was variable again. It started off really nice um, and then clouds came in. We got quite a bit of snow. It was very cold. We had minus 25 on one night. Um, and on this day, uh, the weather really turned badly um, and we had a really nasty storm. So we're heading up around this corner. And actually this is the same valley where 
where we saw the bear tracks um, and it was it was getting very windy it was very cold it was about minus 16 and and kind of 50 mile an hour winds and we kind of bailed out sometime in the afternoon so we needed to get the tents up um yeah this is what it what it was like outside um and then we had a huge storm um which meant we were in the tents for a day and a half um and it dumped about a meter of fresh snow uh, but it was very windy as well so we were conscious that there was going to be um, a big avalanche risk. Um, uh, and then at this stage, um, three of the three of the group had to leave and they were just coming out for just over a week and they had to go back. So we say goodbye to uh, Lizzie and Anna and George. And the, the remaining four of us carried on um, uh, and crossed a pass and then um, we discovered just how uh, how high the avalanche risk was. So we were coming to a point where we needed to ski down a kind of roll into the next um, valley. And uh, purely through vibrations in the snow, there was, we were nowhere near this avalanche when it actually triggered. We were up over the over the crest here, and we heard a rumble. Came around the corner and seen saw that the uh, the energy from our skis had, had triggered an avalanche remotely around the corner, like 50, 50 meters away. Um, and it's quite, it's big, you know, the crown's at least a meter and a half. Um, so we skied into it because we figured that was probably the safest spot. Um, and then down below that slide. And actually, as we look around, we could see there's a much bigger one. So this is looking across to an, a much bigger slide, which had also gone from the same uh, from the same slope and this is looking back up at the two of them so this is a small one and two people in it here still and this is the big one which is really quite sizable um, so we realized that the it was very uh, high avalanche risk at this point um, so we carried on downwards uh, we're about to turn up this valley to the right um, which we do oh this is interesting this is um, this is Simon Gershon with his homemade sledge on the end of a plumbing pipe, uh, which I think is a pretty unique invention. Um, but actually that worked quite well. I'm sure he'd be very happy to give you the, uh, the design if you wanted that. Um, uh, and this, this is interesting. So this is, we were just skiing up this. It's not a proper valley. It's a, it's a kind of micro feature, but we were skiing up here. And at one point someone took their bag off and dropped it on the floor and triggered this avalanche just around the corner from where we were. So again, we realized at this point, the whole place was absolute hair trigger conditions. So we pitched camp fairly close to there and, and uh, stayed a night there. And then in the morning we had a conversation and uh, talked about our options and basically decided that we couldn't safely move from where we were. Or we couldn't safely go up from where we were. Um, and we couldn't see that the the risk in the snowpack was going to change very quickly. So um, we decided at that point to bail out and head down. Um, so we skied out uh, down to this is one of the kind of characteristic bridges that they have in that part of the world. And again, uh, ended up in this place. Amazingly hospitable guys. Uh, this is just the first kind of settlement that we came to, and they took us in and gave us tea and. Let's hang up our wet socks on their stove and stuff like that, which is lovely. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then, so uh, two of the guys at that point flew home and two of us, uh, me and Richard Anthony, uh, decided to stay on for the original flight. And we we thought, okay, if there's no, we can't ski in Kashgar because it's too dangerous. We're gonna do, we're gonna hire a car and drive out further south and see if we can find some better conditions there. So we did a little road trip of Eastern Turkey, looking for somewhere to ski. And there's several places. So there's a volcano here called Sufan, uh, another one here. Um, and there's a range here uh, of quite decent mountains. So we thought we'd go and have a look for some snow. Um, and I'll just race through these, but this was a kind of interesting road trip, mostly because it's culturally fascinating. Uh, this is a town in, in the east that looks like the kind of Soviet Union. It's it's on the high plateau. It's still covered in snow in March and it's pretty grim. Uh, and there was a lot of this driving through featureless and um, snowy high plateau. Um, and actually the weather didn't, 
improve at all. It was incredibly windy. Um, so we tried skiing twice. One time we just nearly got blown away and then we managed one very, very short tour on the south coast of Lake Van. Um, but that was really it. Um, and then drove down to near the Iranian border looking for other places and all we really found were kind of interesting archaeological sites and nice friendly locals. Um, so it's fun, but we didn't really get to do much. Um, this is a, of interest. This is a town called Chaldaran, which is near the Iranian border and holds the record low temperature in Turkey, which is minus 49, which I'm always kind of amazed by. Um, it's colder than pretty much anywhere in Europe. Um, so the next area that we're going to have a look at is uh, Alada, which is the highest range of the Taurus Mountains. So the Taurus Mountains go essentially along the Mediterranean coast, inland a little from the Mediterranean coast. And it's a quite a, com there's a, it's a very long range with lots of different parts. Uh, but this particular massif, Alada, is the highest and it's quite small and compact. Um, and I wanted to go here because I've been trekking there the summer before and uh, it's really spectacular. And I thought, okay, this would be interesting for a ski trip as well. So this was, um, and we just had a week this time. So it was a quite a short route. Again, we're trying to do a traverse rather than skiing from base camp or skiing peaks. Um, uh, and we are doing an east to west traverse. So this way across this range over a kind of high plateau here, you know, which is called Yeti Gala and Seven Lakes. And that's a kind of beautiful spot. So uh, this is the village at the oh, eastern yeah. end um, where we just got to manage to get transport to. Um, you'll come across this dog later. Um, and again, we just found some accommodation with, with some local people in the village who were really lovely and hospitable. Um, and then headed off up towards the mountains. So a bit of a walk in, um, but we got to the snow, snow pretty quick. Um, and then there's a kind of forested zone um, and a really spectacular valley that leads in from this side for the Hadja Valley. Um, so it's got these pine forests, kind of really nicely spaced trees, um, which would be great skiing at the right if you were there kind of earlier in the year. Um, and some really spectacular rock faces. Um, so skied up this valley, um, up to kind of near the, near the end of the, of the kind of base of it. Um, and you can see this dog that was in the village actually followed us. Um, and uh, we made the mistake of giving him some food early on and he just wouldn't go. So he followed us up all that day, um, right up into the mountains. Uh, and we found this amazing campsite with a beautiful view. Um, this is the same, this is in the, in the morning from the same place. And the dog had slept out uh, next to the tents overnight. So we've got this dog here and we desperately tried to get rid of it, but it just wouldn't leave. Um, so uh, dried off the bags, um, set off again and for the main part of the climb, really. Um, and there's a fairly big climb here. Um, some, again, some really spectacular rock faces up here. Um, and as you'll see, the dog is still following us. So we're up at about 3,000 metres now, actually higher than that. And on all these photos, somewhere in the background, you'll see the little doggy. Um, uh, and that night, we so we pitched camp in this high plateau. And that night, it started to snow, and the dog was outside. And at some point, we thought, OK, we just can't leave him out there. He's going he's gonna to die. He was kind of shivering and stuff. Um, so we let him into the tent. And, and really, the rest of the trip became about the dog. Uh, it was a very, very sweet story. I mean, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see more of it, but um, it was a kind of ridiculous, but brilliant little adventure we had with this dog. Um, so the next day, uh, basically snowed all day. Um, and also one of the guys I was with had really bad blisters. So it was actually quite useful to have a, a day off. We were planning to ski some peaks from this camp and then carry on the day after, but that didn't work out. This is the dog. Um, that morning under a space blanket, um, not spin drift and snow. Uh, and then the next day, actually, it, it cleared looking really nice. Um, so there's been a lot of snow overnight, really beautiful. Um, this is a famous peak called Direct Ash, which is one of the kind of um, 
famous places in Turkey for rock climbing. Um, uh, and there's lots of stuff to do here from here on a ski day. So we're thinking we might get out and do something today. Um, but actually the weather turned again, snowed really hard. Um, but we went out and, and just did kind of some very brief sort of forays from the, from the tent. Uh, then came back to the tent. This is Andre who developed a, a real bond with uh, the dog. And we had to we had to think of a name for the dog, and uh, we tried all sorts of things. In the end, it became known as Whimper after the uh, after the kind of Alpine mountaineer, which, which was kind of appropriate somehow. It was very sweet. Um, it was a funny day though. It kept kind of breaking and then snowing again. So we had a bit of time sitting outside, and then we went sledging and uh, Wimper's enjoying the sledging as much as we are. Um, and then this is just a bit of a look around the plateau where we're staying. As I say, there's lots of peaks that you can ski from here. Um, uh, it's a really good little base for a day or two. So the next day, um, then it's da it dawned really fine. Uh, it's windy though, so it's been windy overnight. The snow's a bit crusted over now. Um, but we head off to finish the journey over to the other side of the mountains. Um, and some really spectacular peaks up there. Um, and we decided to climb one of them. So this is a peak called Emla, which is the, the third highest peak in the range. Uh, but it's kind of the easiest of the big ones to climb. Um, so we just walked up there. Um, and actually, the doggy made it up here as well. Um, this is on the summit, and then we're going to ski into this valley behind here, which is really spectacular. Um, this is just heading down into the top of it, and again, you can see Wimper uh, running along in the ski tracks. Um, and then we're heading down into this kind of big canyony valley, um, which leads out to the west. Um, and we're still all tower markers at this stage. Um, and you can see here uh, Wimper's tracks running through, just sort of lolloping through the deep snow. Um, and then we get lower down, and actually there's a kind of narrow bit with canyon really narrows, and you go through a, a kind of steep section with this big overhanging wall, which is really spectacular, and which is kind of up here. And then you come out and it widens out again. And then you come out to a kind of big slope that leads you out of the mountains. Uh, and this is really this kind of nearing the end of that um, that traverse, but it's been a great little adventure, particularly um, with some kind of interesting rock formations, but particularly with the dog added a, a kind of random fun little element to it. Um, and then this is just walking out to the west. Um, one of the other things that's nice about Aladar is it's very close to Cappadocia. So it's really easy to tack on a day or two in Cappadocia, which is this beautiful um, place in, right in the middle of Turkey uh, with these fantastic rock formations and ancient uh, cities that are built into them. Really, really lovely place to spend a bit of time. Uh, and then it snowed overnight when we were there. Um, so having done that trip, um, doing a traverse from east to west, I thought, I really loved the place and I thought it would be interesting to do a north-south traverse because that's actually longer and we'd see a whole load of new terrain. So with just one other person, one friend, the following year uh, we went back to do that and um, this was intended to be kind of very fast and light so we were minimalist gear and just the two of us and carrying about a week's food I think we had, six or seven days food. And we we're trying to do a traverse from here and actually further off to the left but we didn't end up doing it so um it's not on the map but starting off further off to the right and then a day climbing up onto the onto the kind of halfway up and then crossing this path onto the main range oh what happened to the dog um th that was fantastic um uh when we got to the village on the other side um there was someone uh, basically just phoned up. He knew someone in the village that the dog had come from, phoned them up, and they drove over. And about three hours later, they turned up in a pickup truck and took the dog back home again. So it was all, uh, it all worked out beautifully. Um, so this trip, yeah, so we start off 
um, again, quite a big, quite a walk in. Um, and uh, this year was a lot drier. So it actually took a while to get to the snow. Um, and then it was, it was actually cold, uh, cold and windy. Um, and all this snow is pretty hard frozen. Um, and it kept, it was, we're at that zone where you keep going in and out of, out of the snow. So it's quite, quite a pain. Um, then getting a bit higher. Uh, and this is actually on the, on the main uh, coal that takes us into the range from the south. So this is up at about 3,200 meters or something like that. Um, and then this is in an area called the Emily Valley. So on the south side of the range, um, there's a big valley that comes in from the west called Emily. And I've noticed that there tended to be more snow in there, which is part of the reason why I wanted to investigate it. So that we had a camp down there. And this is a really beautiful, spectacular spot. And um, skiing out of there the following day. So we're heading up eastwards and we're going to try and take a pass up to the left somewhere up here. Um, uh, and as we're, as we're heading up, this sea of cloud rolled in behind us, but it never actually caught up with us. So we had some really fantastic views out over the mountains with this sea of cloud below. Uh, and this is a peak called Caldi, which is one of the highest. Um, and we're heading up. This is the coal that we got to that takes us actually over to the eastern side of the range. And then we're going to pop back again. We keep kind of crossing from east to west on this traverse. Um, Again, it's really, really cold and windy up here. Um, absolutely rock hard snow. Um, and we had a very, very lightweight tent, which really wasn't warm enough at all. Uh, so it was quite uncomfortable. Um, so dug in very well. Um, and then the following day, we need to, this is the kind of key to the route actually, we need to cross a section uh, here, which takes us right over the, some of the highest ridges and there's not an obvious pass uh, so we get onto the onto the ridge and we follow the ridge for a bit and then we need to find a route down here somewhere which is all pretty steep um, and there's no real date in, info on it so we're kind of looking for a route down um, and we, we end up hoping to take that ridge that you can see down there which is a lot steeper than it looks um, and this is, we got onto it, and um, this is a kind of bit of a um, cautionary tale. We started descending this ridge, and it's, um, it's again, it doesn't look too bad, but it's actually pretty steep and uh, very sort of slabby rock and really hard snow. And my friend Doogie had a pair of super lightweight aluminium, aluminium crampons, and uh, basically they fell apart. Um, uh, so halfway down this ridge. So we were in a bit of a nasty position, had to kind of kick steps and skitter back up here. And then we managed to find a gully with enough snow on to, to get down a different way. But that was, um, it was really unfortunate because actually it meant that we, we needed the crampons for the rest of the route. So at that point we decided we couldn't carry on with the main traverse, um, which is a real shame, but uh, we needed to head out. Um, and essentially we're in the same place, we're back on the high plateau, so we're going to head out the same way that we did with the dog the previous previous year. Um, this is the slope that we were kind of trying to come down, just, just further left on the, on the ridge. Um, and as you can see, this, this is right up at the top of the coal. Uh, this is the peak of Emla, which we walked up the year before. Um, this is nearly 3,500 metres and it's quite a dry year, but it's also incredibly windy up here. So this has been completely scoured of snow. Um, and then lower down, there's much more snow in the shelter of that canyon that you've seen before. Um, again, long walk out. Um, I've got two more trips there, which I'll just talk through very quickly. This, these, just to show you some other bits. And the main thing that I want to say here is this valley on the right hand side, Emla. Um, um, it, there's a lot more information about this now, but at the time, it was hard to get information on kind of snow and weather and stuff. And but what I'd noticed was there would seem to be more snow in this valley than there was up here and further north. And actually that's confirmed. What I realize now is looking at kind of weather patterns and the, um, what you can find online, the weather comes from the Mediterranean. So actually the southern end of the range is much snowier than the northern end. So I really wanted to have a look in here and see if we could do some good um, kind of uh, 
camp based day, day skiing, ski touring from a base camp. Um, and this was an Eagle Ski Club trip again. Um, and I, I co led this one with uh, Shirin Carell, um, who I don't know if anyone, any of you know, but is a, is a um, half Turkish woman um, who, who is a brilliant skier. Um, and actually, we very briefly set up a company together to, to try and do ski touring in Turkey. And uh, this was the this is the one trip that we ran, um, and we did it for the Eagle Ski Club. Um, but it was a kind of joint trip that we ran, and it was great. Um, so, and this was really different. Uh, one of the main reasons was that Shirin is obviously fluent in Turkish and has contacts out there, and it meant that we could pre-arrange a bunch of stuff. So we stayed with this um, this family in the village to the west. And this is a guy called Salim, who is absolutely lovely, and his wife. And he, we stayed there for a couple of nights and also he is a local farmer, so he's got a tractor. And that meant that we could, he could drive us up to the snow line and be on the snow line with the tractor, which really helps because it's, depending on the season, it can be a long walk in up to the snow. Um, and this is fantastic. It adds a whole dimension to the experience because you're getting, you know, you're staying in a local house and having nice food, and it was it was fabulous. Um, and yeah, this is the, the the ride up to the base of the mountains in the tractor, which was really handy. Um, this year, a lot snowier, um, and we, there was actually snow down in the kind of uh, in the forest zone, so we had a kind of half day skiing in the trees. And then came up to the base camp and again um, this was different from all the previous trips I'd done because we had a base camp, a proper base camp with a tent and Simon came up with us and he, um, he didn't get the tractor all the way up to here but he got it fairly close so we had proper kind of food that he cooked for us every night which was fantastic. Um, this is Simon just doing a, a kind of sort of barbecue on an open fire one night for us. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more snow this year. Um, so we did some day day tours from that camp, um, which is great. Um, it was a slightly more mixed group, um, but that was good. Um, so this is heading up to the end of the valley again. Um, and actually, this area up here on the left is where in Doogie we went to, to a coal up at the top here the year before. Um, uh, really spectacular up here. Um, we just skied up to another high coal just for a day ski. Uh, this is the next day. Again, there's a peak here that we wanted to try and ski called Alaja, which looks like a possible ski peak, um, about just under 3.6, I think. Um, and this is this amazing, there's a pinnacle called Pamakaya, um, which is near the camp. Um, then skied up to this high coal, um, uh, but we didn't make it to the top of the peak. It was quite a kind of technical section, it turned out. Um, uh, and this is just... Uh, the next day at base camp uh, and then we walked out and then we're coming in now to do the second half of the trip which is going to be a traverse again but this time west to east so we're going back over the same ground but in the other direction um, and this is heading up the place that we've been before and uh, I'm just showing what it looks like in different weather for one thing but there's also we do a bit of different stuff at the top which is worth having a look at um, but a beautiful day skiing up and over the coal and again we're camping below this peak of direct ash up on the high plateau uh, and a beautiful spot um, a really lovely evening up there so the next day we're going to go and ski the peak of Emla which we'd walked up I'd walked up previously with Andre uh, and then this time we're coming up from it's the north ridge that we're going to ski um, it looks fairly straightforward um, and this is kind of the final approaches towards the peak really really beautiful day and spectacular peak to do not difficult but really just really lovely um, and kind of good panoramic view from up there uh, and then an amazing ski down as well we had really lovely snow this is me losing my hat on the way down but beautiful ski straight down the face uh, back towards the campsite and then uh, it was kind of really only half day so uh, Sharon and I went out and just played around the, the base camp a little bit and um, this is uh, uh, doing a jump and me just jumping a little cornice. Um, I've switched to alpine skis by now, um, uh, so don't telemark after this point, really. But um, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, this is final night in that camp, and then we head off the next day 
so yeah, we're heading out now, back down. So we've just got to ski out on the Eastern Valley, and but again, a beautiful day. Um, and we're skiing down the way that we come up a couple of years before. Um, and that was a nice ski out back in this valley. And this is just a little curio because on the way out there was a um, there was an eclipse. Uh, it was a 98% eclipse, and this is just in the slightly weird light of an eclipse. Um, and again, on the eastern side, there's this interesting place, amazing waterfalls that come straight out of the out of a rock face, which is worth a look if you're in that area. Um, and then final trip there, this is 2011, so quite a bit later. I did most of my turkey ski trips in the early 2000s, and then I went back with two friends in 2011, and this was kind of to do a bit more, we were trying to do some more peak bagging and, and kind of steeper skiing. Um, but again, conditions are really different again. Uh, we're going back to Emily Valley in the south where there's more snow. Um, and actually this year, there was loads of snow. It was completely different, really beautiful. Um, and this is the same base camp that we had before where there's, we almost got to in the tractor and there's hardly any snow. This is this year, there's tons of it. Um, and again, this is the, the Palmakaya rock. Um, but actually this, particular trip turned out to be a bit of a washout. We had a huge snowstorm while we were there. Uh, but one amazing thing that happened was that um, during the second day of this huge snowstorm, uh, we noticed outside there were these little groups of birds in the snow. And there were kind of two groups of them, and there were kind of 20 or 30 in each group. And they were all different species and they were huddling together. So it was, uh, they must have come up too early, it was in March, and they must have come up too early and then been surprised in the Highlands by this snowstorm. And they were, they were dying basically. And they all, I was amazed by the fact that even cross species, they huddled together to keep warm. And in fact, they came into the tent. So some of them came into the tent. Uh, this is two of them in the tent on a rucksack. They sat on our shoulders, sat on our hands. Uh, it was absolutely extraordinary. Um, and sadly, a couple of them died in the tent. Um, uh, but it was just a really kind of amazing moment um, to see it. Um, anyway, after this big snowstorm, uh, we went out to have a look, um, but quickly realised that it was looking pretty dangerous. There'd be some huge avalanches. You can see one up here, another one that come all the way into the valley and down the valley. Um, and this gully here, which, we, which I'd skied a few years before, um, the whole thing had gone. So we realized it was pretty dangerous. So we decided to bail out. Um, we didn't have, we were only there for a week anyway. So this was about four days in. So we had a, we decided to take a day and just do some tree skiing where we thought it would be a bit safer. Um, so we headed out from the camp um, down the valley. Um, uh, see someone down there. There's actually a kind of depression. So this is heading out down the valley, but you, the base camp is down in that hole there. Um, and we had a day of fantastic powder skiing. Um, in this section of the valley, there's about 400 metres of trees before you get above the tree line. And uh, so we were just doing kind of laps of that, which was fabulous. Um, and that's, I think, the end of that trip. So, so finally, just two other areas that I'm going to cover really quickly. Um, and these are things that were tacked onto the, other, uh, onto the end of other trips. So this is an area called Bolkar, which is also in the Taurus Mountains. It's the second highest massif, and it's near Aladar, slightly further south and west. And this was just two nights, kind of th two and a half days, two nights that I did with uh, Sharon at the end of our Eagle Ski Club trip, um, just to kind of explore a bit. Uh, she managed to, to borrow this, this is the mountain rescue truck from the local area and she managed to borrow that which is very handy so we drove up to drive up to the snow line this is the Bolkar, so just it's another limestone range um quite similar to aladar but not quite as spectacular um but really good ski touring anyway and you can see this is this is aladar in the background um the other big massive um so uh, this is a strange hotel i think that was never actually completed that's kind of halfway up um, uh, skiing up the first day to our camp and it's quite it's interesting terrain um, some good rock faces some steep peaks uh, but plenty of good skiable stuff in between as well and I think there's kind of scope here for some really good touring um, so we set up camp here 
Um, and then we did a day out from there and skied and climbed one of the, one of the highest peaks. Um, but it was not great weather, very flat light, uh, very windy up there. So a lot of the high peaks were quite windblown. This is the highest peak up here, which is three, five is a, a, and a bit. Um, but there's still there's some really some really good skiing to do there. Um, and this shot is just this is of interest because out to the west of the range, there's a there's a long high plateau. So the main peaks kind of end here, but this area over here. Uh, extends out for about 100 kilometres at gradually going down from 3,000 to about 2,200 metres. So it's all snow covered in winter. And there's bespoke to do a kind of a, a quite interesting kind of journey type expedition, maybe with a sledge um, for, for people who like that kind of thing. But it's just, it's quite an unusual thing in this, um, in this area to be able to do that kind of journey. Um, and this is Another great part of skiing in Turkey. This is in Shirin having a kind of nice lunch after we come down from the mountains. Um, and the food's fantastic. And, uh, it was easier in those days to get a beer than it is now. But um, yeah, that was a fantastic trip. So the other final place that, um, that I wanted to show you quickly is uh, a peak called Ergias, um, which I visited twice on, again, tacked onto the end of other trips. Um, one of them on the same trip. Uh, again, went with Sharon at the end of the same Eagles trip. This is slightly north of um, the two, two areas we've just been looking at, right in the middle, very near Cappadocia. And it's a high volcano. It's actually a volcanic plug, so there's no crater, but it's, it's quite a spectacular peak, <coughs> um, just under 4,000 metres. Um, and it's right above the city of Kayseri, so it's very easy to get to. There's a ski resort on it, um, and you can get a a bus up to the ski resort in about 45 minutes from the city. Um, and it's, it's, as you can see, it's quite a spectacular peak. Um, this is the ski resort. Um, and we're going to, there's two essentially different routes up it, which we've, we've tried both now. Um, one of them comes up this little ridge here and then joins here and goes under this pinnacle up to here. And that's not actually the summit, but it's the, it's the highest point you can get to without climbing. And the other is to follow this ridge to get to the same point here and then finishes the same. So we headed up the lower route this time. Um, as you can see, there's some really interesting looking lines to ski. Um, and we're heading up onto this ridge. Um, but uh, it starts getting very deep. And uh, we get to about 3,500 meters, but at that point, um, the avalanche risk is looking quite nasty. Um, so actually we turn around at that point. Uh, just at the, at the point where the ridge kind of merges into the slope, it's, it looked really nasty. Um, so we skip back down again, but this shot really is to start to show there's some amazing looking lines to ski here on kind of spines and in these little gullies between these amazing rock pinnacles. Uh, there'd be some really fantastic stuff to ski in the right conditions. Um, so we skied out and uh, so this is coming back a few years later, 2011 at the end of that trip and we're going to follow the other route this time um, up onto this ridge uh, and have a look up there. Um, this is just climbing the ridge and just a view out over the kind of snowy wastes beyond. Um, again this is so this is on the top of the ridge. We're going to follow this ridge because there's a couple of kind of little rocky bits. And then the key bit is going around this big kind of pinnacle here and up the side of this. This is called uh, Shaitan, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it basically means Satan's Gully. Uh, and it's notorious avalanche chute. So we're going to try and stick close to the rocks and get up to here. That's the actual summit, um, but you can get to this point on skis. And so that's what we're aiming for. And so we get off the ridge, ski along the ridge, which is really spectacular. You can see these are other ranges of the Taurus Mountains in the background. Um, and okay, we get to, so we get to this pinnacle, go around the bottom and go all the way up the slope behind it. And we're getting near the top, but again, decided the avalanche risk is just too high. We get to a point where there's hollow snow and it's really nasty. So we bailed out again um, and just came back down the ridge. 
Um, so that is it for the, for the tour. So just to kind of have a quick look at this again, um, the areas that we've seen are Kashkar, Aladar, Bolkar and Ergias. There's a few others worth mentioning though. So Munza is an area, again, limestone peaks, 3,500 meters. That would be a really worthwhile place to visit. Uh, it gets a good snowpack um, and it's quite varied terrain, I think. Um, and it's, it's on the edge of an area which has access problems because of the, uh, the PKK. So this area to the south of it uh, has PKK activity. But I think you can actually go to Munza without restrictions. Um, the best mountains in Turkey are right down in this corner um, it, next to the Iraqi and Iranian borders. This area is called Gila and Sat. And the peaks here are just over 4,000 meters. They've got some small glaciers. They're really spectacular, very sharp. And uh, the ski terrain there, I think, would be fantastic. It gets a good snowpack, but you can't go there. Um, it's restricted to foreigners because of the, the PKK activity. Um, and I did try and get. Uh, special permission in about 2006 from the Turkish Embassy in London, but I think it was refused. Um, I don't think it's changed enough. Um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is just the, the volcanoes. So there's more than this, but there are four volcanoes that I think are kind of interesting in Turkey, and you could potentially do a trip that, that kind of puts them all together. And it would work quite well because they're, they're both, there's two pairs that are fairly close to each other. And they're close to a city that you can fly to. So you can fly to Kayseri for these two and Van for these two. And as you go west to east, they increase in height. So they're roughly 3-2, 3-9, 4-1, 5-1. One. So you kind of acclimatize along the way. I think there's a kind of interesting trip to do in that somewhere. Um, Pick up a quick question from Thomas in the chat. How did you manage in the trips without a fluent Turkish speaker? Do you speak any Turkish? Yeah, I do speak a bit. Um, not a lot, but um, I, I've been quite a lot in the summer. So I picked up enough words to kind of get by with some of the basics. Um, and that, if you're going to go, it's worth learning a few. And even if you just have a few, it really, you know, it helps with the interaction anyway. And it potentially helps with with understanding a bit. I think you know generally you can get by uh, one way or another. Either there'll be a kid in the village who goes to school and has learned some English at school, or there'll be. I don't know. I in my experience, it just works. You find a way. Um, so I don't think I don't think that should put you off. Certainly. Uh, well, I'll pop a question in quickly. Uh, what about climate change? What do you think is happening? Or do you know what's been happening with the snow in the decades since you've skied there? I know, so mostly what I know is anecdotal from um, particularly uh, Salem actually, and that was quite a long time ago. So um, the last time we saw him was 2011. Uh, he talked about how different it was from 20 or 30 years ago uh, when, so his village is at about 1300 meters on the west side of Aladar. Or maybe a bit lower than that and he said in winter it was generally snowy there in the kind of 80s and 90s in winter so for often several months it was snowy and now it isn't it's generally dry they'll sometimes have a big snowfall but it will usually melt within a week um so it's definitely changing like everywhere else i think um uh, i don't have kind of more specific information really i mean it's still you know it's still very feasible to ski there and particularly the the wetter areas so Aladar is quite dry it's particularly the north side is quite dry and edges is quite dry but Kashgar gets still gets a big snowpack that's pretty that's reliable I think um this area down here this area called I don't know you know I'm not showing the map anymore um there's another area of the the tourist mountains it's a bit lower but actually gets is right on the the kind of Mediterranean coast facing where the weather comes from. And that, I think, gets quite a good snowpack as well. But it's a bit less interesting terrain. Um, right. A uh, question from Ed. Do you remember what pack weight you were carrying with seven days of food and camping gear? I do, because we were really, um, really careful about it. Um, so the Kashkar trip, we did seven days with, a, with about a 14 kilo pack. Um, which I think is still pretty good going actually. Um, 
I reckon on a on a kilo a day for food and fuel um, is enough. Um, uh, we had a four man tent, which is good. Uh, that ends up really light. Um, it's a bit less flexible than two two twos, but it's much lighter. That was good. Uh, we didn't we didn't carry much with us. We didn't have crampons on that trip, but that was partly because it was a kind of journey, and we were. You know, we weren't intending to do really steep stuff and luckily we didn't need them. Um, I think we had a, yeah, we had a single ice axe each. No ski crampons and no crampons though. So we kind of went really light on that. Um, and I think we did a very light trip in Aladar. I think that was even lighter, but that's probably because of the tent. Um, but yeah, I think you can get away with, if you're really careful with stuff, you can get away with 13 to 15 kilos for, for a week. But that's, you know, you've got to work hard to get it down to that. A uh, question came in from Nikolai. What is the best time of the winter to visit Alad Dagla for ski touring? So is I've always been in March. Um, it kind of depends a bit on what you want. If you want to get kind of nice powder and maybe maybe some snow in the valleys, then uh, I would probably go in February. Um, but March, I've had really different conditions, so I've had it quite dry there, but cold, and or lots of snow. So Aladar particularly, I think, is very variable. Um, I think generally, so the, these ranges are quite high, so they're all they're all about 3,000 metres. I think March is a good time for those. Kashgar, you could potentially go later. So we had some really low temperatures in March um, in Kashgar, so it was minus 25. And... Um, you know, still very much a winter snowpack then. Um, so you could potentially go a bit later, particularly if you're, you know, going to ski peaks, then you might want to go a bit later there. Um, so like end of March, uh, maybe maybe April, early April. Um, but yeah, I think March is kind of, for me, is peak season. And a second question from Nikolai, also about Alekta. Is it possible yeah. to do day trips without sleeping in a tent or is the snow line starting too high? No, it's not really. Um, you could, if you got some, if you got tractor transport, so we did actually do a day with tractor transport, um, which is the kind of skiing in the trees low down, but you, you can only get to about 1800 meters with a tractor. So it depends on, you know, it partly depends on how fit you are. You can do, you know, the, but the peaks are kind of three, five to three, seven. So that's a pretty big day if you want to get to a peak from there or one of the higher peaks. Um, yeah, I think, but actually doing something like the, the thing that we did with the Eagles worked out well. That was a base camp at about 2000 meters that we got to within about an hour of where the tractor could take us to. And then, so it's not very onerous, you know, you just, you've got a big pack for an hour, but that's fine. And then from there you could do quite a lot um but yeah it's not ideal for it's not there's not proper valley base right okay there was a question from dave do you have gps tracks of your routes um i don't have gps tracks but i've started putting them i've started drawing them on um google earth so on KML. i can get KML files of them if people want them and it won't be exact, but it's close enough. Do you have any plans to ski in Iran? I did have, um, but they have just fallen through. So I was hoping to go there in March, actually. Um, but uh, it's looking... It, so the problem with it is um, if you're a UK citizen, they... Uh, the fees, the, if you're if you've got an EU passport, it's much better. But if you're UK, US, or Canadian, then uh, the rules are different. You have to have a guide with you at all times, which kind of makes it um, pretty implausible, I think, to do kind of proper out of the way ski touring. Um, so we've actually given up on that plan, unfortunately. Um, I know David Hamilton's done some trips out there, and but but I don't think for a while, um, but he'd be a person to talk to potentially about um, whether there are ways around it. Hi, can I just ask uh, David, thank, thank you very much, by the way, it was fantastic. Well, why have you not been back for, for 
a few years. So you, you're, you're asked, you, you've started investigating another country or? Um, no, partly, um, well, I got, I got very busy. Um, I, as Cathy said, I co-founded Fat Map and that was a, that was a few years of being very busy. So I didn't really have very much time to do the kind of more adventurous ski touring stuff. So I was doing some stuff in the Alps at the, over that time. Um, I did, when I, I left Fat Map in 2017 though, and I, I did manage to get out to uh, Tajikistan in the year after which was absolutely, that was amazing. That's a fantastic place to go to. Um, nice. Recommend that highly enough. And if you if you want any, if you want information, then, then please just get in touch and I can kind of share routes and just info and chat about it. Um, but yeah, Thank that's you an much. amazing place. Yeah. Hi Dave, Andy here. Andy, hello. Hi, How are you doing? Thanks. Good, oh, thank actually, you. Sorry, and the other place, that I, I started going to Albania. That's the other reason why um, I stopped going to Turkey, um, which we're going to be talking about in the Balkans one in January. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. Yeah. Just wanted to say, yeah, uh, th thank you for sharing remarkable um, adventures in faraway places. But where's next on your on your list? So, so now that Iran's off the off the menu, uh, I'm trying to get a trip together to go to India. Um, uh, um, and that, so either to the valleys to the east of Manali. Um, so we're basically looking for somewhere that's a, it's a three week trip that we're planning. So not too high, but um, with kind of good terrain that we can get acclimatized to in three weeks. So sort of four, four thousand to five and a half thousand meter range. So either east of Manali or a range called Pir Panjal, which is kind of uh, south of Kashmir. Um, so that hopefully will be next, but I don't know. It's all, it's looking a bit ropey next year. So we'll see. But there's a, as you know, there's always a long list of uh, stuff on the wish list. Um, yeah, there's kind of endless things I want to do, really.